Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through section 4.1, scatter diagrams and correlation. Now, I want to say a couple notes before we dive into chapter 4 itself. Um, chapter 4 is going to be different than most of what you've seen in Math 1040 up to this point, and will also be different than most of what you see after this point. Chapter 4 is a little bit of the oddball out, because it has to deal with a different section of statistics, sometimes even considered a different field of statistics. And that field is going to be called regression analysis. Regression analysis has to deal with taking multiple variables and trying to see associations between them, or trying to see if multiple variables can be used to predict some other variable as a response. Um, we're specifically going to be talking about bivariate data in this section, which is data that's collected when two variables are measured for each individual. So instead of taking 25 individuals and measuring all of their heights and trying to find different statistics for those heights, what we would instead do is take 25 individuals, measure both their heights and their weights, for example, and trying to see if there is a relationship between those two variables to see if they interact in some way. That's the whole purpose of regression analysis. Unfortunately, we will not be able to do too much with that here. We're really only going to be able to deal with the beginning of regression analysis with what with uh, bivariate data. But if you are more interested in regression after this point and you would like to study further to see how more than just two variables can be interacting, then I highly recommend uh, looking for other resources that are available to you um, to widen your knowledge on this section because it can be very interesting. Um, the other note I want to talk about is the fact that we are going to use a lot of lists in this section. And in 4.1 specifically, we're actually going to have six lists that we're going to be using. Um, the six lists, I'll scroll down so you see where they are. Uh, the six lists that we'll be starting with, the first two, list one and list two, are going to be on the bottom of page four. You'll see X and Y, each of which have five values. That's going to be list one and list two, respectively. Then list three and list four are going to be at the top of page 5 for commute time and Gallup Health Ways Wellbeing Index Composite Score. Um, each of those are their own separate list. Then the last two lists, list 5 and list 6, will be at the bottom of page 5. You'll see height and head circumference for this table here. Note that this table is one table that's been split up into two pieces. So you'll see f six values for height first and then another five values for height on the right side. That's one full list, so those 11 values for height should be considered list 5, and then the 11 values for head circumference should be uh, considered list 6. We'll get back down to these when uh, we get to that point in the notes, but just want to let you know of those lists in case you wanted to get those in ahead of time. Okay, well, let's dive into it here. So, as I was saying, that we're going to be dealing with bivariate data, where we're dealing with two different variables associated with each individual. Those two different variables we have are going to be called the response and explanatory variable. The response variable is the variable of interest in the study, so the one that we're focusing on and we want to say something about or try to predict, um, that may be explained by the value of another variable or variables. That variable that's trying to explain the response is called the explanatory variable. The explanatory variable is a variable that may explain the value of the response variable and is sometimes also called the predictor variable because it is used to predict something else. Now, a lot of students have trouble with the specific notation here and the whole wording of explanatory response, prediction, stuff like that. Um, at the beginning, a good way to start to get it in your head, to start to understand how these two variables are interacting, because they are interacting in a specific direction, um, a good way to start to get it down, and I'll put these in quotes because I want to be cautious with this, is similar to a cause and effect relationship. Now, before I go on, the reason that I say that these are in quotes is because I really don't like to use these terms, and specifically the word cause. That's a very dangerous term to use in regression analysis, as we'll talk about later on. Um, but it's a good way to start to get in your head in terms of the direction of relationship between these two variables. The explanatory variable is the one that you use to try to predict the overall response. So explanatory one is one you start with, and the response is the one that you get from that. That's the direction of relationship, which is why it's similar to a cause and effect, where you start with the cause and then you get the effect after that. Um, again, 
do not use these two words when trying to actually define these two terms or when trying to uh, use your own work to explain what's going on because these are two very dangerous terms. I just say that these are in quotes because it's a good way that you're most likely already familiar with. Um, you're probably already familiar with cause and effect in your head from previous classes or previous situations. Um, and that's a good way to get it going in your head of how these two variables interact with each other. Now, because we do have two variables, we are going to be graphing these two variables, and we're going to be graphing them on these separate axes. The explanatory variable, the one we start with, the explanatory variable, we're going to put on the x-axis. You notice that explanatory starts with an x, and likewise, it's going to be on the x-axis. So that's a nice way to connect those. The response variable is going to be associated with the y-axis. When we create these on two different axes, what we graph in the middle of them is what we call a scatter diagram or sometimes called a scatter plot. I sometimes use both those terms interchangeably. A scatter diagram is supposed to try to show the relationship between two quantitative measures. Note that that part is important, that scatter diagrams are only good for quantitative variables. Um, when you draw a scatter diagram, what you're going to have is a graph that looks something like this, where you have your x-axis and your y-axis, or your explanatory and response, respectively. And then when you find your individuals, your individual is going to have some value for x and some value for y, and then you graph them by representing a dot in the middle of the plot. Whatever their x and y coordinate is, is showing what values they have for each of those variables. And then you're going to have a lot of individuals in this plot. So you're going to have a lot of dots uh, scattered around in this plot. Our goal is to try to see if there's a relationship going on between these two variables, to see if there's some pattern when I gr draw each of those points. The patterns that we're looking for, what we call relationships, the main one that we're going to be talking about here are linear relationships. That's the one that we're going to be able to analyze in chapter four. A linear relationship is one where the relationship between the two variables seems to look like a straight line of sorts. For example, the two graphs that we have here, this first graph seems to follow that straight line, and the second graph seems to follow that straight line. Doesn't really necessarily matter the slope or how steep the line is or the direction, but if it follows a line itself, maybe it's scattering around, that's what we're going to be calling a linear relationship. Now, as I said, regression analysis is a much bigger field than what we're going to analyze here. And other regression analysis would allow us to analyze nonlinear relationships, relationships that don't follow a straight line. For example, this graph here follows more or less a negative parabola shape, whereas this uh, last graph follows a kind of, it would be a cubic shape is what we would call that. So it, it does seem to follow a general pattern and shape, but it's not a linear one. Therefore, in this class, we're actually not even going to be able to analyze nonlinear relationships. We're going to either determine something is linear or not linear. Those are the two different conclusions that we're going to have. If there is no relationship between those two variables, what it tends to look like is a random scattered cloud. There does not really necessarily seem to be a relationship between as one increasing and other increases or something like that. So this kind of clouded shape would imply that there's no relationship. Also, the one that I drew earlier, it would probably be considered no relationship. I don't see much of a pattern going on there. Now, it's going to be hard to really say if there is a relationship going on, even if you have the graph or not. Um, so there are going to have to be ways that we're going to have to use mathematics to calculate a way of determining is there a relationship or not. The two different types of, of linear relationships we'll talk about, remember we're only talking about linear ones, we're going to have either positive or negative relationships. A positive relationship follows a positive slope. So if you're familiar with algebra with positive slopes, that should be a lot easier to do. What a positive relationship means is that as one variable increases, so as the x is increasing, then that means also the y is increasing. Or as x decreases, the y decreases. They're both going in the same direction. So that's what positive relationship means. Same direction for the variables. As you can see here, this is a positive relationship. It's going up into the positive direction. As one is getting bigger and bigger, the other one is also getting larger and larger. 
comparatively, a negative relationship will go in opposite directions. The two variables we have will go in opposite directions. As one variable is increasing, as I go along this x-axis, for example, then that means all the va values in response, the y is going to actually decrease. It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is what we would call a negative relationship, and it follows that general trend. A couple examples here to get that down. For example, uh, number of hours worked and amounts of pay received. Well, if you work more hours, you should receive more pay, so they're going in the same direction. Likewise, if you work less hours, you receive less pay, still going in the same direction. Negative relationship will go in opposite directions. Uh, for vehicle weight and gas mileage, generally if your vehicle weighs more, then it typically will have a less uh, miles per gallon rate. So it'll uh, take more gallons to get down the street. Um, that would be a negative relationship. As one increases, the other decreases. Now, as, as I said, it's going to be hard to determine if it's actually linear or not. In a lot of cases, there's going to be some that are fringe and they're not incredibly easy to tell where you would argue, well, maybe there's a linear, maybe there's not. The way that we're actually going to calculate and argue linearity is with what we call a correlation coefficient. So this is going to be one of the keys in chapter four, analyzing the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is going to be a number that measures how strong the linear relationship is. So it's going to be a judgment value. Depending on how strong the correlation coefficient is, that will also in turn def define how strong the linear relationship is. Again, note that every time we're talking about a linear relationship, we're only going to be able to analyze linear here. Even if there does seem to be some other kind of nonlinear relationship, the correlation coefficient will not be able to tell that. So be careful. Now, the correlation coefficient is very important, and there's uh, things you need to keep in mind with the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is going to be a number between negative 1 and 1, and generally the closest the closer it is to those two values means how strong the linear relationship is. So if r is equal to 1, for example, that means that there is a perfect positive linear relationship, because it's a positive one, and if r is close to negative 1, that means a perfect negative linear relationship. If it's not exactly on either of those, it'll be some decimal in between, but the closer it is to either 1 or negative 1, the stronger the linear relationship. So the closer to positive 1, the stronger the positive relationship. The closer to negative 1, the stronger, stronger the negative relationship. So it's not really a number that you, you uh, use and then multiply with or do a lot more mathematics. It's a number that you use and look at to judge how strong the relationship is. Just how close it is to uh, 1 or negative 1. The closer it is to the middle, to 0, means that there is no relationship, hence nothing. So 0 means no relationship. And the closer it is to 0, the less relationship there is. So that's why it's uh, more of uh, a scale there. R is not really going to have any units, so we don't say that it's number of feet or anything. It's a completely different um, type of measure, so don't put any units on it. And also it is not resistant. And what that means is that if you have outliers or extreme values, that will tend to really influence R pretty heavily. So be careful of outliers. And we tend to uh, look at the scatter diagram to see if there were outliers that maybe we should consider taking out. Now, there is a formula for R, but it's really complicated. We're not going to use it. We are going to use our TI calculator for that. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but first I want to go through some graphs so you can start to identify graphs that look like they have specific correlation coefficients. Okay, so we have here matched the linear correlation coefficient to the scatter diagram. We have four different correlations here. Um, the first one we have is R is 0 0.787, then 0 0.523, 0 0.053, and 0 0.946. I think the best way to go through this is to start off with whatever the strongest linear relationship is, which is going to be our last one there, D. R is 0.946. I note that that is the strongest relationship because that's the one that is closest to positive 1. All the other values are a little bit further away. Because that's the closest one to negative 1, it should likewise also have the strongest relationship, uh, or the strongest looking graph to a linear relationship. And looking at all these, the graph with the strongest relationship, or the one that looks closest to a straight line, is definitely this first one. This first one is the one that I would connect with letter D, with 0.946. 
look at those dots. If I were to draw a line, a lot of these dots are just a little bit far away, and a good amount of them are even on that line. Um, so that is defining a really strong relationship. It seems pretty linear. After that, the next strongest I see is 0.787. 0.787 would be the next strongest because it's the next closest to 1, the other two being 0.523 and 0 0.053. 0 0.787, since that's the next strongest, it should also connect with the next strongest graph. Now, the next strongest graph is a little bit of a toss-up. This one's a little bit hard to tell. I'd say it's either 3 or 4. It's definitely not number 2. 2 looks very weak. Um, but 3 or 4 both follow a general linear trend. If we draw, draw, try to draw a line between each of these... Uh, most of the points are following this line, but some of them are just a little bit off. I'd say, though, that 4 has a lot more outliers, ones that are really far away, and we tell how far away it is by how far vertically it is from the line. These points seem to be really far away, whereas 3 does have a couple of these, but really only one that's really far away. So I'd say 3 is probably the next strongest, so 3 is likely uh, letter A. That would then mean that 4 is the next strongest, so that would be B, and the weakest one, 2, looks like a general cloud. Yeah, you could probably argue that there's a line going here, maybe, but it really isn't strong. It doesn't really seem to explain a lot of the data too well, so this is going to be C, a value that's almost 0. Okay, so right now we're just connecting correlation coefficients to graphs. We also have a few here for negative relationships. Remember, negative, relation, negative R is fine. It just means that it's a relationship that's negative, whereas typically the explanatory increases, the response will decrease. So you get this general pattern. Uh, looking at the same way that we did last time, the strongest one I have is C, which is R is equal to negative 1. That's the strongest it could possibly be. If C is uh, if you have either negative 1 or 1, it should imply a uh, simple straight line, and that has to be our first graph here. This is a simple straight line. There is no deviation at all from the line itself. The next strongest after that, I do have a couple in the 0.9s, but D is the next strongest with 0.99. A is 0.96, so 0.99 is stronger, and that would likewise define the next strongest line. Now, 2 and 4 both seem pretty strong. If I were to draw a line between each of these, both of these seem to follow a general linear pattern. But 4 seems to be more clouded. There seems to be more spread between them. Because it's more wide, I'd say it's less strong. And 2 seems to be more compact with, within all these points. So 2 is probably the next strongest, so that would be D, followed by A being uh, number 4 there. 3 is the most clouded of, of the two. Maybe there is a general linear pattern uh, that's negative. I'd say it's more negative than positive. But overall, a negative line still doesn't explain a lot of these values too well because I have so many numbers that are really far away that don't really seem to follow a general pattern. So this is the weakest, so that's B. Okay. So a couple other things before we get into how to calculate the correlation coefficient yourself. Uh, first, we have uh, some examples of trying to connect between these and trying to identify what kinds of relationships these probably would be. And most of these are judgment calls. I highly recommend stop the video, go through each of these yourself, and try to see if you can tell what kind of relationship you think these would be. Okay, for the first one, interest rates on car loans and number of cars sold. All right, well, interest rate on car loans and number of cars sold, that could go either way. Um, some would say that the more cars you sell, then that means the interest rates will go higher because it's in higher demand. Some would also say that um, if you increase the rates on car loans, then that would decrease the number of cars sold because it's more expensive to get the car. So I'd probably go with that last one and say it's more likely to be negative. But I could see an argument going the other way, depending on the direction here. Uh, B, temperature outside and ice cream sales. All right, well, this one's a lot easier. As temperature outside increases, we're basically just trying to think of as one increases, what happens to the other. As temperature outside increases, that likely also means that ice cream sales increase. Um, so if you increase the outside temperature, if it's getting like in the summer, ice cream sales tend to go up in the summer. Um, so this is more of a positive relationship. They're going the same direction. 
for C, numbers of hour, hours worked on the treadmill, so let's start with that. As you increase the number of hours on the treadmill, your cholesterol level should start to drop. So you're exercising more, so that should mean that you're healthier, and therefore your cholesterol level should go down. Since these are going in different directions, this is a negative relationship. Uh, for D, price of a Big Mac and number of McDonald's and French fries sold in a week. Well, okay, well, as price of a Big Mac increases, the number of McDonald's French fries sold doesn't really seem to have much of a relationship. So I'm just going to put a question mark there. I don't really see a relationship between those two. Those are completely separate things. So because I do see no relationship, I would say there's no correlation. Or no relationship. No linear, anyway. Uh, e, shoe size and IQ. Okay, as shoe size increases, this is the same as before. I, I don't know how that should influence your IQ, so I'd also say that there's no uh, correlation here. Although I have seen some people argue if you consider age with this, with shoe size, um, in terms of, well, children are smaller and they have smaller feet, and they tend to not have a higher, as high of an IQ as adults, so that there could be a connection there. Um, but that's kind of stretching it, and I think that's introducing more variables than just these two. So there should be no correlation between shoe size and IQ. Uh, movie ticket price and number of movie goers. Okay, as movie ticket price increases, what happens to the other one? Uh, number of movie goers. Well, if you increase the price, then probably less people are going to go see it because it is more expensive and that costs more. Some could also argue that it's more exclusive, so maybe that will draw more people, but I, I don't think that it would incline less people to actually go see the movie because it costs more so most likely a negative relationship and lastly years of education and annual salary okay well as you increase the years of education typically is considered that your annual salary also increases so that would likewise be a positive relationship so just trying to connect those now, this last definition, before we go into how to calculate the correlation coefficient, is why I was trying to be cautious before about using the term cause. Um, lurking variables are something that we talked about back in Chapter 1, but this is where they really become important. Lurking variables are variables that are related to both the explanatory and response variable, and because of those variables, we say that a significant linear relationship does not imply that one variable causes another. Lurking variables are these variables that are in the background that we may not have considered before. Um, and because we're only analyzing two variables, for example, shoe size and IQ, because I'm only analyzing those two variables and I'm not considering other ones, there are other variables that are typically influencing a system. A lot of things in life are more complicated than just two variables. But because of that, it's really hard to say that uh, just because two things seem to be related to each other means that they are causing each other. That's why I was very cautious before about using that term and said to just think about it that way in your head to get the direction. But you want to think about it as a relationship in terms of does one is one typically predict another or does there seem to be a relationship between two variables? Um, all we can say is that a relationship exists. We cannot say for sure that one causes another. So um, that's why do not ever use the word cause in this. And if you ever see a conclusion that uses the word cause, then that means it is a fraudulent conclusion. Okay, so um, sometimes there's even a phrase here in statistics, I'll say, that correlation does not imply causation. And that's also a term you tend to hear in news outlets as well uh, when trying to talk about studies that have been released and people that are uh, being critical of them. Because correlation uh, does not imply causation is a real thing. You need to be careful of this. Um, as an example of that, there was uh, there's a, a classic study that a lot of people bring up for correlation does not imply causation. Um, in the summer of like 1998 or something, uh, some scientists looked into different variables and started to analyze the um, the amount of ice cream being sold in that summer of 1998. And during that time, they noticed that as ice cream sales increased, there was another variable that increased at the same time. And that variable was the rate of murder. 
So since they noticed that both murder and ice cream sales were increasing at the same time, some tried to, to hopefully jokingly imply that, okay, well, since they're both increasing at the same time, that means that ice cream causes murder or murder causes ice cream. No, we, we should not be able to say that. There's likely something else going on there. A lot of people would point at the temperature, for example, of things that could be influencing both of those and maybe really explaining what's going on. Um, so just because two things seem to be increasing or decreasing at the same time or have some inverse relationship, do not say that they are causing each other. So be very careful of that. It's a very important thing for... Uh, correlation coefficients and uh, and doing just any linear relationships. Okay, um, so how to calculate R and how to use R. So as we saw some R values before, we saw some R values that were like negative 0.969, for example, and that's really close to negative one. Most people can very easily say that's pretty strong, that's pretty linear, there's no problem with that because it's so close to negative one. But what if I had an R value like 0.723? Well, 0.723 seems pretty strong, but is it strong enough? Like, it's starting to get further away from 1. Or what about something like 0.618? Well, that seems closer to 1 than 0, but is that close enough? It's starting to get even further away. We need some level of how strong it needs to be for our uh, relationship to be linear or not. So the way that we're going to use R is by taking R and taking its absolute value, which means that we only look at the positive version of it. So if we had negative 0.618, for example, for R, we would instead look at the positive version of that. That's going to be our first step. Then what we're going to do is calculate what we call a critical value using this table here, table 2. This table will always be provided for you on tests and exams, so don't worry about that. Um, but you do need to be able to find this for homework purposes because table two is going to be your uh, useful tool in order to determine how good R is. Depending on your sample size, which is going to be this first column, depending on your sample size, you will have a specific level for the correlation or, or for the critical value. So, for example, if you had a uh, sample size of 13, that would mean that you would use a critical value of 0.553. The way you use that then is say that the correlation coefficient will only imply a linear relationship if your correlation coefficient beats the critical value. So the critical value is the value that you need to beat. If R is, or R, the absolute value of the correlation coefficient, is greater than the critical value, we say the linear relationship exists. It's either positive or negative depending on the original value of R, if it is positive or negative itself. If R is not big enough, if R does not beat the critical value, we say that no linear relationship exists. And I'm going to underline linear because that's really important. We say that no linear relationship exists. We don't know about other types of, linear, of relationship. We just know that no linear one does. It could be some curvilinear linear or non-linear relationship. So that's how we're going to use R. So we're going to come back to this table a lot. Um, in this, these next few sections. So make sure you have this tabbed or something. All right, now how to find the correlation coefficient. Uh, now, there is a function in the calculator, but it probably won't work for you initially, and we need to turn on an option to make it work. Um, you'll, thankfully, you only need to do this option one time. As uh, long as you keep the same calculator, you don't take out the batteries while it's on, you don't mess with it. Um, you should only need to do this once. I also cover this in my Chapter 4 uh, Linear Relationship Calculator Tutorial video, so you can also see it there if you need to see it again. Um, but I'll go through it real quick here. Um, the option that we want is not turned on, and we need to turn it on. To do so, what we're going to do is go into the catalog of the calculator, which will list every function the calculator has. To do so, we're going to hit second. When we're on the main screen, we're going to hit second, and we're going to hit the number zero. So again, if you, when you're on the main screen, hit second and hit the number zero. This will open up the catalog and you'll see stuff like absolute value, and, angle, ANOVA, stuff like this. These are all the functions in the calculator. The one that we want is called diagnostics on. And since it's in alphabetical order, you can tell that it's going to take until you get to the letter D, which will take some time because there's a lot of functions in here. 
The fastest way to do it is to skip down to the letter D by using the button on the uh, calculator that corresponds to the letter D. If you see above math, in my calculator it's in green, it says A, app says B, program says C, and X to the negative 1, above that printed on the calculator should be the letter D. Now you don't need to press second or alpha or anything for this, just hit X to the negative 1 and it will skip down to the letter D for you. So if you haven't already, just hit X to negative 1, you should skip down to D, and you should start to see day of week, DBD, DDC answer, stuff like that. Um, that makes this a little bit easier, so it takes less scrolling, particularly for my calculator, which, as you notice, is a lot slower, and there's some delay when I click buttons here. Um, but again, the function we want is diagnostic on. So it shouldn't take too long when you get down to D, um, and you should see diagnostic on after the option for diagnostic off. Currently, the calculator is set as diagnostic off, which will not show the correlation coefficient when we want it. We want it to show it, so we want to do diagnostic on. So we scroll down so the cursor is on that. We hit enter on diagnostic on, which will paste it to the main screen. And then we hit enter again to run it, and it says done. Now again, as long as you keep the same calculator and you don't take out the batteries while it's on, stuff like that, um, you will never need to turn that option on ever again. So once you do it one time, it's done forever, which is good. Uh, but again, if, if need be, you can always come back to this video or check out my uh, video on linear, linear regression for calculator tutorials. All right, now how to do linear relationships and find correlation coefficient. To, to show you how to do this, there is a printout here to explain everything, but I'm gonna show you how to do it uh, just in this video here, and I'm going to do so with this example. So this example has a really small data set, five values for x and five values for y. Since they tell us which one is x and y, we know which one is the explanatory and which one is the response. So x is your explanatory, y is your response. Um, it won't always be the case that the first list you have is explanatory and the second list is the response. You need to make sure which one is which, um, either by looking for those letters of x and y, or trying to see what relationship exists in the description. So don't always assume that the first one's explanatory and the second one is response. However, what we want is to have both of these lists in our calculator, and I have these as list one and list two. So x is L1 and y is L2. Once you have these in your calculator, what we want to do is run linear regression on that. And some of you may know where linear regression is because it actually has shown up before. We just didn't use it. Um, to do linear regression, what we're going to do is hit stat, then we're going to go over to the calculate tab, just like we were to do one var stats, which we did in chapter three. The one that we want here, though, is the fourth option. If you see number four, if I scroll down to number four, I see L-I-N-R-E-G. That stands for linear regression, which is what we are doing in chapter four. It also says AX plus B. What that's going to do is give us the equation of the line, which we will be using in section 4.2. Now, some may also see that on number 8, uh, there's another linreg. If you scroll down far enough, you'll see linreg a plus bx. That's another function for linear regression. However, I recommend against using that one and just use uh, number 4. It'll be a lot more familiar to what you may be used to in algebra, and you will not cause any problems with um, confused values. So I highly recommend just use number four, linreg ax plus b. When you open up linreg, if you have the wizard, you should see the screen. If you do not see the wizard, hold on for just a moment. Um, if you have the wizard, it'll ask for the x and y list, which is really nice here because we know which one is which. So in this case, we want the explanatory first, which is L1, so I do second one. And then I hit enter to get down to y list, which is gonna be in list two, so second two. It'll also ask for two other options, frequency lists and store reg EQ. Frequency list is if there's a frequency list associated with your explanatory variable, um, which I don't think that there are any in this chapter at all, so you should never need to worry about that one. And store reg EQ will take the equation of the line, which we'll use in 4.2, and put it into the calculator to graph. Um, but we don't need that, so we're also typically going to leave that blank. The only two options you should ever need are X list and Y list. I'm going to hit calculate. And then we should see these options, y, a, b, r squared, and r. 
If you did not do diagnostics on, then that means you would not see those last two options, which includes R, the correlation coefficient. So that's why we needed to turn that on. Now, if you did not have the wizard, then what you saw when you went to do, go do linreg AX plus B, two, three, what you saw was linreg AX plus B printed on the main screen with the cursor. What you need to do is work with this like it was uh, one variable stats, where you would put in first the X variable, so the explanatory, and then comma to put in the response. So L1 comma L2. All right, so in this case, we have our R uh, value. We have R is 0 0.907, which seems pretty strong. Notice I did that without even graphing. If we graph it, though, we should be able to see this kind of relationship. And I'll just do a really quick graph. So X being 2, Y being 1, if this is 0. Uh, 2 would maybe be here, Y 1 here, so I'll put a dot there. 3 and 4, so 3 here and 4 up here maybe. Uh, 2 was already here and 3 would be here-ish. Uh, 4 was here and 5 was up there. Oh, no, that was not 4, that was 3. So 4 would be here and 5 would be up here. And then we have 1 and 1. So something like that. Generally, this does seem to follow a general linear path. The real one that causes the problem is this one, at least by my uh, artistry here, um, which is why it does seem to have a pretty strong relationship. R of 0 0.907 is pretty close to 1. But our question is, is it close enough? Particularly when you have a small sample size, that may not be good enough. So let's start to note some things. Um, this will help us start to get down all the pieces. Just note that depending on your teacher, you may not be asked explicitly to uh, fill in blanks here. You're going to need to know how to find stuff. Uh, step one should be to find our R value there. Step two should be to find our critical value. To find our critical value, we need to find whatever our sample size is. Since we have five pairs of values here, we have two, one, three, four, two, three, four, five, and one, one. That's one, two, three, four, five rows. Then that means our sample size is five. Each row is considering a different individual. Because our sample size is five, we can then go up to table two to find our critical value. So table two right here, we go down until we find n of 5, that's our sample size, and therefore we find our critical value to be 0 0.878. So, whoops, let's go down a little too far. Critical value of 0 0.878. Now we have our R value, the correlation coefficient was 0 0.907, and we need to see if the R value beats the critical value. Thankfully, R being 0 0.907, or even the absolute value of R being 0 0.907, is bigger than 0.878. So it is larger than, point, than the critical value. Since R is bigger than the critical value, that should imply that there is going to be a linear relationship. So we should be able to fill out the rest of these. R is a positive number. and R is 0 0.907 is greater than the critical value of 0.878. We found that out. That's what this step was doing here. Since our R value is bigger than the critical value, that means we've passed our threshold to determine linearity. Since we are more uh, positive than we need to be, then we can say that a positive relationship specifically a positive linear relationship exists. We say a positive linear relationship exists because R was positive. If R was negative, then there would be a, uh, then we would say there was a negative linear relationship. If it was the case that R did not beat the critical value, we would then say that there's no linear relationship. So it's kind of a, a few step process. First, you find R, second, find the critical value, three, compare, and four, conclude. Those are the four primary steps that you're going to do with
correlation coefficients and with linear relationships. Find R, find the critical value, compare the two, and then make your conclusion. Okay. So we have a couple of more examples here so we can start to get this down. Remember in all of these, we are going to consistently refer back to table two to get our critical values. We have here the Gallup organization regularly surveys adult Americans regarding their commute time to work. In addition, they also administered a well-being survey. Which variable do you believe is the explanatory variable and which variable is the response? Okay, well, in this case, we have uh, how long it takes for them to get to work, their commute time, and then how they rate their own well-being. Well, in this case, it makes a lot more sense to go from whatever your commute time is, that is likely influencing your well-being score. It is less likely that how you rate your well-being will then influence how long it takes for you to get to work. Um, unless there is some overall deity that looks down and says, oh, that person does not like how, they're how well their life is, so I'm going to make their commute time to work longer than it should be. Um, that doesn't really make too much logical sense. What it more likely is, is depending on how long it takes to get to work, that will imply how, uh, how well you rate your well-being. So with that direction in mind, we would say that the explanatory variable, the one that you would start with, would be the commute time. So I'll say CT. And the response from your commute time, your commute time would influence or predict your well-being score. So those are likely the explanatory in response. Now again, in this case, it happened to be the case that commute time was X and the Gallup Healthways was Y. It happened to be the case that the first one was X, the second one was Y. That's not always going to happen. Do not assume that the first column is always X, the second one is always Y. That is not true. There's a reason I keep bringing this up. So, All right. Now, what we're going to do on B and C is we're going to calculate everything. We're also going to draw the scatter diagram. Now, drawing the scatter dra diagram is a little bit optional, but it's going to be really nice uh, to see everything. So I'm going to go through that pretty quickly. Um, first, we're going to make sure that we have our list in list three and four. I have commute time in list three, and I have the well-being healthways score in list four. You also want to make sure that they have the same amount of values. That's a great way to make sure you didn't miss anything. If you have uh, two lists that don't have the same length, then you're going to get some errors. Okay, now what we're going to do is try to graph this. What I'm going to do first, though, is just hit Y equals. If you hit Y equals, you will see a bunch of these things that say Y1, Y2, Y3, etc. You want to make sure that this is blank. If you see anything here, make sure you clear it out. It happens pretty often that as your calculator is shuffling around in your bag, some stuff will uh, end up here, or maybe somebody else was using it and put in some formulas. You want to make sure nothing is here. So if there is anything here, like 65 plus 2, uh, X, something like that, if there's anything there, you want to go to it and hit clear to get it out of there. So make sure nothing's there. Uh, when you have that confirmed, then what you want to do is, if you see what, right above y equals, you see the word stat plot. That will be how we plot any statistics graphs. So to get to that, we need to hit second y equals. And you should see plot 1, plot 2, plot 3. Um, now all of these should be off already. If any of them are on, if plot 2 or plot 3 are on, what you want to do is go down to them. So you want to scroll down to them, hit enter, and make sure you change the option to turn it off. But for now, I'm just going to go into plot one and hit enter. You'll see the first option is on and off. We are going to use this graph, so I am going to hit enter on on, so this one turns on. Then if you hit down, you should see a few options. And to get to each of these, you go left and right. So I would go left to right to get to each of these options. The first one's going to be a scatter plot. The second one's going to be a line graph. Third one's a histogram. So, and the fourth and fifth one are box plots. So you can actually make a lot of the graphs from chapter three in here if you would like to. But we're just going to make the scatter plot real quick. So we're going to have that first option selected and hit enter to make sure that's confirmed. If that one's not highlighted, make sure it is already. Then you hit down to get to X list. X list is going to be whatever value was our explanatory, which we determined was commute time. That's an L3. So I'm going to do second three. And my Y list is in list four, so second four. All right, now what we're going to do is try to graph this. So I'm going to hit graph, 
and you may see most likely that the graph will not adjust appropriately. It looks kind of like, for me, I see a blank. So this is not what I want. What I want is I want the scatter plot to be zoomed in on the appropriate location. In order to do that, what we're going to do is go to zoom, which is the third button in the middle there. And we want to go to the ninth option. So there's more options than I thought. I hit down to get to the bottom. Uh, but you want to go to the ninth option, which should be called zoom stat. There it is. Zoom stat. Zoom stat will zoom in on the stat plot that you created. So hit enter on zoom stat, and there you go. So that would be my scatter plot. Uh, pretty nice. Uh, it's not necessary, but it's very convenient if you want to get a picture of what's going on. A lot of people are visual learners, so I completely understand this helping people. Um, all right, just looking at that graph, that looks very linear, so we're probably going to be expecting a linear relationship between these two, but let's confirm that by finding our correlation coefficient. So I still have everything in, in list three and list four, so I'm just going to go to stat, go to calculate, and run number four, linreg ax plus b. Uh, I'm going to hit my x list l3, my y list l4. Remember, if you don't have the wizard, it'd be l3 comma l4. The comma being above the seven. And what we get here is an r value of 0 0.981. 0 0.981. That seems very strong, and it does agree with the graph that we had. I can even hit graph to look at the graph again. That seems to agree really well. 0.981 seems very linear. Actually, it was negative 0.981. I apologize. Uh, second answer. Yeah, negative 0.981. Got to be careful of that. Negative 0.981. Um, very linear because it's very close to negative 1. However, we still need to compare it appropriately to the critical value. So we got our first step done of R. Now we can find our critical value. Looking at my table, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows. So my sample size is seven. And with that sample size, I can go up to table two to find my critical value. In this case, I go down until I get to N of seven. And I find my critical value to be 0.754. So 0.754. And now this is why we do the absolute value of R. Um, if we didn't do the absolute value of R, any negative relationship would always be less than the critical value. However, our goal is really how close it is to 1 or negative 1. So we don't actually care about the positive or negative. We more care of how far away it is from 0. So that's why we look at the absolute value of R, which would be 0.981 here with no negative. And if I compare that to 0.754, I can see that R is going to be greater than 0.754. Now, R is a negative number. R is point nine, uh, negative 981. And the absolute value of 0.981 is greater than the critical value of 0.754, which is what we just confirmed here. And since our absolute value of R beat the critical value, since we beat the critical value, that means that there is a linear relationship, and the type of linear relationship depends on what R was originally. R was originally negative, so we say a negative linear relationship exists. And that's that. Okay. So this is a long video, but we got one more to do, and then we're done. A uh, pediatrician wants to determine the relationship that may exist between a child's height and head circumference. She randomly selects 11 three-year-old children and measures their heights and head circumference. And we have these lists in list 5 and list 6. Remember that height is one list, even though it's split up into two, so it should have 11 values. 27.75 up to 27.5, all of those. Same thing for head circumference, that's all in list 6. Um... So the question is, is the pediatrician, if the pediatrician wants to use height to predict head circumference, so that direction, so height to predict head circumference, that's the direction we're going. Determine which variable is the explanatory response. Since that's the direction we're going, that means height is the x, is what you start with, and head circumference is the y. That thus means that the explanatory is height, and the response to that 
the one that uh, we use height to predict, is the head circumference, which I'll say is HC. Now again, it happened to be the case, first one's X, second one's Y. Not always going to happen, just happens to be here. The pediatrician could have easily gone the other way and said maybe they wanted to look at head circumference to predict height. Okay. So I have these already in L5 and L6. So over here, L5 and L6. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw the scatter diagram and then we're going to go and get the correlation coefficient. So let's look at what the picture looks like. I'm going to hit second y, just as I did before. So second y equals, and then we're going to go into plot one by hitting enter. I don't want to make a new plot. I'm just going to overwrite the old one I had. So it's already on. That's good. The second option is already a scatter plot. So that's good. Don't need to change that. I do need to change the x and y list though. Need to change those into L5 and L6 respectively. Then I go and graph that. Again, I get a blank image because now the points are elsewhere. They're not in the same place as the previous ones. So we need to readjust the bounds on the graph. To do so yet again, we go to zoom and we want to go to the ninth option. We can either scroll down to nine or we could just hit the number nine to select that option. And we get a new plot. This one seems to be positive, and overall, uh, even though there is a little bit of scatter, this still seems to follow a positive linear relationship. But we should be able to confirm that by finding what the R value is. So just looking at it, it seems to be linear, but we're going to be able to check. To do so, we're going to go run linreg x plus b. So I do stat, go over to calculate tab, and run the fourth option, linreg x plus b. And we do so on list 5 and list 6. Remember, keep freak list or frequency list and store reg EQ blank. You don't need those. And we get an R value of 0.911. So R is 0.911 positive. The reason I'm always rounding to three decimal places is because we're about to compare it to a critical value that's always in three decimal places, by the way. Now, since we found the, the R value, which is technically step one, drawing the graph is optional. Um, we now need to do step two, which is finding the critical value. Our sample size here, you can look at the table or even in the description, it says they selected 11 people. So N was 11. And if I go back up to table two, sorry for the movements I have to do here, but uh, for table two, we go down, we find 11 is here. And that means our critical value is 0 0.602. R is 0 0.911, critical value is 0 0.602. R in this case, yet again, is larger. Even though, looking at this, I don't think that there should be a relationship between a head and height circumference. It seems strange. But that's showing that uh, your own bias could influence what you think should happen or might happen. Um, R we found was positive 0.911. So R is positive. And the absolute value of it is still 0.911. We found that that is greater than the critical value of 0.602. So, because, yet again, our, our, our value beat the critical value, that means that we have a linear relationship, and the type of linear relationship depends on what R was. R was a positive 0.911, so likewise it is a positive linear relationship. Alright, that's everything for 4.1. I know it's kind of a long section but it's introducing a lot of these. 4.1 and 4.2 are going to be the long sections of Chapter 4, and then after that it'll slow down. Um, but with that said, that's everything for Section 4.1. You should be able to complete the homework at this point, so I recommend doing that before moving on into Section 4.2. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below or uh, ask your instructor, either one. Uh, but with that said, I hope you have a great day.